yeah, 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 yeah. My name is uh, Kachingwe Singoi. I'm the political assistant to the general secretary of the Socialist Party of Zambia called Rainbow Party. Uh, talking about the, the mining sector in Zambia is quite interesting, especially that uh, uh, it all gets back to the, to, the, to the government. Let me just give you a brief history about the mining sector in Zambia. Uh, Zambia got independence in 1964. Even when we got independence, our mining industry was still being run by Anglo-America. Up until 1970, when the government of uh, Kenneth Kaunda, the UNIP government, nationalized the mines and came up with a, with a parastatal called ZCCM to run the mines. Uh, at some instances, the mines would operate at break even and at times they would make profit. So what government then would do when it, when it operates, on a, when it, it makes a loss, they would uh, subsidize the mining sector so that it, it operates at a break-even point, so that they can keep jobs for the people that are working in the mines. Up until 1991, when there was a change of government, and uh, President Frederick Chuluba, under the MMD government, won the election, and decided to pursue a new liberal approach by privatizing all the mines. With the privatization came with a number of policies that was not protecting the interest of the masses. You would find a situation whereby the government will come up with policies that protect the interests of the so-called investors that had bought the mines and in some also instances, the mines, in trying to make profit, will lay off some workers. So from 1995 to about 2001, most of the mines in the Copper Belt Prime Zambia were privatized. And among the people that bought the mines were the Chinese people. So the Chinese people came with cheap labor. They were trying to play smart by not laying off most of the people most of the miners, but they instead reduced their wages. The other miners like uh, KCM, First Quantum, and uh, Barak Gordon, they laid off some workers trying to make profit out of the mining sector. With that, uh, from, 19, from 2002, which, from 2001 we changed government, and we had a leader by the name of President Mwanawasa. Uh, he's associated with the Chinese investors because he's the one who came with a lot of Chinese. And uh, a debate came up on how we should best tax the mines so that we can get the most. Especially that most of our people have lost jobs. Some of them had resorted to be into so-called business. So there was a need to come up with effective taxation system that would get the people of people benefit from that taxation system. And the tax code wind for tax was introduced. Now that wind for tax only worked for a while, especially from 2003 to 2007, because at that period, copper prices had gone high. And with the wind for tax, when copper prices are high, it benefits both the, the mine owners and the government. But when copper price started going down, the mine owners realized that they were not getting the most out of the copper. So when you have a government that protests the interest of the investors, every time there's such a scenario, they always side with capital. So we had a situation of, of whereby the wind for tax had to be stopped, and they started talking about another mine uh, taxation system that they think will best fit the copper prices at that particular time. But if you are politically conscious, you would know that that change, that discussion was for the sole purpose of 
trying to protect the interests of the investors. Since 2008, we've had challenges in coming up with a proper mining taxation system in Zambia. Right now, the Zambian people don't get the most from the copper in Zambia. They don't. Most of the people right now are not employed. The few that are employed are employed with most of, with one of, like I would say, the, the little that are employed, they are employed with the, the Chinese mines and they are working with slave wages. Then we've also had some other mines that have, even after the price, copper price have gone down, they are still in Zambia, but they've laid off a lot of workers. Just recently in uh, uh, June, uh, KCM, that is a Konkola copper mine in Chingola and Kitwe, had announced to say they are going to lay off workers because they don't think they are making so much profit in the, with the copper that they were mining. And then one of the government officials, the government spokesperson, went on TV and said, the government is going to see to it that no miner loses a job. But one week later, 10,000 miners lost their jobs. That tells you who caused the shots. That tells you that the so-called investors dictate policies that they want government to, Im to implement so that they can make profit out of our copper as Zambians. So the copper story in Zambia, I don't know the right way to use. Some people say, instead of benefiting from the copper, it's a case in disguise. We haven't benefited. Instead, most of our people have suffered. There's a, there's a town in... A, in the copper bed called Mufrila, where the extraction of copper, when they extract the copper, there's a place where you take it for, for, for smelting. It's called copper smelt. Now, when they are smelting the copper, there's smoke that comes out and it pollutes the mining towns. So you come to, to a point whereby our water is polluted in most of the copper bed towns. Our people get to inhale polluted air. But we don't get the most out of the copper. You find that most of the roads in some of these towns are in deplorable state. But the copper is still mined. Yeah, it gets back to, to one, another uh, uh, saying that I always like to quote. To say, Africa living in abundance yet poverty stricken. Poverty stricken. How do you explain that contradiction? It's for, the explanation to that contradiction is that we don't own the means of production. We still don't get to benefit from the resource that God has blessed us with. We have states that protect the interest of Western powers. And for that matter, colonization never left Africa. It only evolved to neocolonialization, whereby we've got governments that are puppets of international monopoly capital. And most of these governments, they don't get to implement their manifestos, which they promise the people when they are campaigning. They instead start implementing policies that protect the interests of international monopoly capital. So Africa can only be economically independent if we get to control the means of production. That's when we can appreciate the natural resources that are in Zambia, that are in Congo. Yeah, it gets back to, to one, another uh, uh, saying that I always like to quote to say, Africa living in abundance, yet poverty stricken. Poverty stricken. How do you explain that contradiction? It's for the explanation to that contradiction is that we don't own the means of production. We still don't get to benefit from the resource that God has blessed us with. We have states 
that protect the interest of western powers and for that matter colonization never left africa it only evolved to new colonization whereby we've got governments that are puppets of international monopoly capital and most of these governments they don't get to implement their manifestos which they promise the people when they are campaigning they instead start implementing policies that protect the interests of international monopoly capital so africa can only be economically independent if we get to control the means of production that's when we can appreciate the natural resources that are in zambia that are in congo talking about education in zambia and africa in particular uh, we have to get back to colonization so they have to get back to colonization but as africans we are still suffering from what i call colonial hangover whereby we get independence but we don't get to dismantle the institution that are colonial in nature and education is one of those institutions we've got an education system in zambia which is colonial in nature to an extent whereby we don't produce quality graduates we produce engineers that can't not even i would give you a practical example a uh, crushing of stones in zambia is big business like people tend to crush stones manually using a hammer when we have engineers coming from the university of zambia who can't think of coming up with a simple mechanism a simple instrument they can use to crush stones that tells that our education is not it doesn't fit the african terrain we need an education that has to be fine tuned to the african terrain so that we can start producing graduates that can appreciate the african terrain and make something out of it but we produce graduates that are well vested in western knowledge we've got a lot of graduates in the streets of lusaka today simply because what they learned at the university of zambia they cannot be able to apply it in zambia it's not always that you have to get a job sometimes as a graduate based on the education that you get if it's quality education that befits the country that you are living in you can be able to make something out of your life but that's not the case in zambia we've got a lot of graduates that are unemployed simply because the education system it's it's still colonial in nature there is need for us to be able to dictate our own education curriculum that befits the zambian terrain right now we've got the education system that only works for the west and it fails to work effectively in our own countries in africa uh, since independence for us in zambia there is only one university we can say it's a genuine university because it was built as an university that's the university of zambia right now in zambia we've got three functional universities and a number of them that are being built among them is the same university of zambia that i've talked about which was which was built as a university the copper university wasn't a university it was a college and it was later upgraded to be a university there's another university called mulungushi university in the central province of zambia it was a college and it was promoted to be a university so right now there are only three public university that we can talk of and with a number of private university that offer western curriculum to our people but the only university that we can work with are public university because we can be able to dictate the education curriculum so right now i can say we only have three public universities and a lot of private universities and a number of public universities that are being built not to talk about those universities that are being built because already we're having challenges with the already existing universities lecturers stand and again they are on strike because they are paid late they are on go slow because they are not paid on time so you get somebody who's supposed to finish a degree in four years finishing it in six years because of such challenges so why should we start talking about building more universities before making sure that the already existing universities are efficient that's the challenge about the education sector in zambia
So it's an African case. <laughs> like I said earlier on, colonization never left Africa. Yeah. And I think Bob Marley was right to say, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Absolutely. And Amika Cabral qualified that when he said, re-Africanization is equal to economic emancipation for Africa. We need to write our own history. Everything we know about ourselves as Africans was told to us. So only when we understand who we are and how powerful we are as a force, how we are powerful to the history of this world, that's when we can be able to, to make impact and dictate the direction that this world should take. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda was, was left. Uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But I, uh, I wouldn't say he was socialist. He started propagating what is called humanism in Zambia, which is close to being left. So he was left, but I wouldn't say he was socialist. And within six years of his presence, from 1964 to about 1968, 1970, we saw a lot of infrastructure development. He built more than 52 secondary schools. He built the University of Zambia, the, uni the University Teaching Hospital of Zambia. So within the first six years of his presidency, we had seen a lot of... <laughs>